Welcome to Work Life Leader Live. My name is Julie Cohen. I am the CEO of Work Life Leader. Uh, and you are watching uh, us live. Uh, this is the Work Life Leader Live book discussion. This is a special episode. Uh, and we're going to be talking about The First 90 Days by Michael Watkins. Um, for those of you who have not seen Work Life Leader Live before, this is uh, a conversation that I have with really smart people about interesting topics on the intersection of work, life, and leadership. And uh, today, um, or this evening, or this afternoon, depending on where you're watching, um, will be hopefully as interesting as our other ones have been. Uh, and I want to introduce my guest. So welcome, Bill Hyman. Hi. So for us, Julie, it's good evening. So good evening. Good to yes. see you again, and, and thank you for having me back. I think this is the third or fourth time, so I know you are delighted to be back. You are definitely a regular, and um, I always enjoy our conversations, and you always bring so much to the discussion. Um, and so, with that, let's just say hello um, to anyone out there who's with us watching live. So it is Tuesday, seven p.m. Eastern on the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. East Coast. Um, if you're watching live, please put in the comments, say hello, use hashtag live if you can. Um, let us know where you are um, watching from. Um, Bill and I are right outside of Philadelphia um, in two different houses. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's always good to, to know where, where you are. And we'll, we're going to be asking for your, um, your input and your questions and your comments throughout. You, do not, you did not have to have read this book. Um, we're going to be giving you kind of an overview and really talking about it. But ideally, um, anyone watching this will will steer our conversation. So with that, before we dive into the topic, I want to formally introduce Bill. Um, and I'm just going to read your bio so I make sure I get all of the... Make it short, Julie. Make it short. The highlights. I'll make it short. But yes, I will. Because if I didn't, we'd, I'd, no, this no, whole no. show would be your bio. Give, so give, give, um, with that... Give second intro. Yes, Bill Hyman is a seasoned human resources executive and leadership coach, having worked in multiple industries, including Fortune 500, mid-sized private, and nonprofit organizations, with his last role as chief human resources officer at CDI, a leading national professional services firm. I'm also honored he's an executive coach with Work Life Leader, as well as a subject matter expert on a variety of topics, um, and he also runs his own HR consulting firms. Uh, consulting firm. One of Bill's many claims to fame is that he was host of Let's Talk Careers, which was a, a weekly radio show in Philadelphia focusing on workplace issues. And this ran for 11 years. So really, I'm with a pro. I Work Life Leader hasn't even been around for a year yet. So someday, Bill. Um, so again, welcome. And we have a few people who said hello. So let's see. We have Robert Holloway live from New Jersey, and um, Chris Midgley. Hello, Chris, from Ellicott City, Maryland, and Colette Scott, um, 4 p.m. in Tucson, Arizona. Great, so we've got someone on, on the West. Um, and if you're, again, feel free to let us know you're here. Um, the more you participate, uh, we love your questions and comments, um, and we will respond to all of them. I will, and I'll throw Hard, the, I'll throw all the hard questions at Bill Hyman, okay? Um, all right, with that, Bill, let's, um, well, let me talk about why this book. Um, I was made aware of this book a few years ago. I was in a, 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 a meeting with a group of leaders that I was, you know, that my company was working with. It was a cohort of about 15 leaders, and um, the CEO of the company stopped into our cohort meeting um, I think it might have been a, the end of a 12 month program and she was kind of came by to send to, to talk about some final thoughts as these leaders were concluding, you know, a significant leadership experience. Um, 
And she shared with the group this book, The First 90 Days by Michael Watkins. And she was like, this is a book you all should read, regardless of whether you're, you know, regardless of what your first 90 days are. It's important to know the content of this book. And at the time when she she mentioned it, I knew of the book, but I hadn't read it. So, um, you know, I made sure I got it. And now we're talking about it. So I thank her. Um, Esther, if you're watching, you know who you are. Thank you. Um, and uh, so that's why we're talking about it. And when I mentioned it to Bill Hyman, he talked about, well, why don't you share your thoughts on the book, Bill, like just in general? Well, so thanks, Julian. Again, thanks for having me back for the third or fourth time. Um, so I know a number of people that you now, uh, that you shared that are uh, with us today. And, and I think we all recognize that leadership is really hard. It's challenging. It's probably one of the most difficult jobs uh, in, in organizations. And one of the reasons I really like the book, Julie, is first of all, I think the name of the book's very misleading. So the titles you've mentioned is the first 90 days. In my opinion, it's a revolving 90 days. In fact, Watkins talks about in the book is that every 90 days you should probably do a reset. So it's a really good, the book's divided into 10 different chapters and my language, not Watkins language, it's kind of like the 10 core focus areas that all leaders should focus on, especially if you're new to a leadership role in the first 90 days. Um, but I, I just think it's easy to read. I think he's spot on in terms of what leaders should focus on. And um, I think it's a must read for anyone who either is in a leadership position or who's aspiring to be a leader. Great. Um, so I, yeah, so, so I think you, you did a perfect job of explaining that. I agree with everything you said. So let's, before we dive in, we always start with an icebreaker. Mm. So um, I, and, and just so people who are watching, we're gonna ask for your answer at some point shortly. So um, pay attention to what Bill's saying, but. Think about your answer to this question too. <laughs> I know. Um, so what was a mistake that you have made in the first 90 days of a position that you've had in your illustrious career, if you've made any mistakes? You, you said mistakes, not mistake, right? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, a, a mistake. Let's say one. Okay, there's many. But the first mistake of many that I can remember making was my first leadership position. And that was many years ago. And one of many reasons was challenging was I was the youngest person in the room. So everyone on my staff had significantly more years of experience. And it was a career uh, consulting outplacement uh, organization. And um, I was, I felt way over my head because everyone had more experience. So I focused, so the mistake that I made in my opinion, Julie, I focused much more on my lack of technical experience versus all the other leadership potential that I had. And that was one of the reasons that I was selected in, in, this, uh, in, in that role. Yeah, um, great. So Again, I now the, 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 the tradition on Work Like Leader Live is then I'll answer it, but I, I want to prompt anyone who's watching, um, please share your a mistake you made in the first 90 days of a position, a job that you've had. And it can be recent or you know, any time in your career. We'd love to hear what those are. Um, for me, I, I was thinking back, so you know, I'm I'm in a situation in that I have not been in a in a full-time traditional role for over 20 years. So um, but thinking back to, to probably my first major leadership role. Um, you know, those first 90 days, I think I, I sat back too much. Um, you know, I, I definitely wanted to listen, but I think um, I forgot that I was hired for, because of my, my past experience. And um, I think I didn't, you know, one of the, what we're gonna talk about, one of the challenges that sometimes people do is they they come in with the answer and they, they think they know everything. I think I held back too much mm -hmm. and you know assumed that you know I was just going to come in and take take over where my predecessor left off. And so I think I was pretty young, so you know I I, I just didn't want to rock the boat too much. Um, and it took me longer to I think make a um, an impact than than 
I, looking back, I would have liked to. So that, that, that's what I come. So anyone who's watching live, so just to reintroduce, um, this is Work Life Leader Live. This is the Work Life Leader Live book discussion. And we're talking about the first 90 days. And our icebreaker is we'd love to hear, um, you know, a, a mistake, a situation that maybe didn't go as well, you know, a challenge that you had in your first 90 days of any role. We just love to get, get some ideas of what people have experienced. Or if you are maybe transitioning into a new role, whether it's a promotion or um, starting in a, in a new organization or, or just a new project, um, what are some concerns you have? Like what, what are questions you have? So we'd love to hear that um, regardless of what platform you're watching us on, just put it in the chat box and we will get to it. So Bill, I wanna start with um, the chat, talking about the challenges with transitions. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna go over, I'm, from the book, um, you did a great job talking about the, um, the the crux of the book are these ten what what he calls ten strategies for transition acceleration, and we're going to talk about those in a bit. But I thought before we got to the 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 strategies, um, he clearly aligned some major challenges, and I just want to read through those, and and we'll talk about a couple, and then we'll see what other people are sharing as as their issues. So. The um, challenges with transition, um, what he calls transition traps, are sticking with what you know. And again, I think that I fell to that, um, that I mentioned. Um, falling prey to the action imperative. Setting unrealistic expectations. Attempting to do too much. Coming in with the answer. Um, engaging in the wrong type of learning and neglecting horizontal relationships. So those are the, what they call the transition traps. And before I turn it over to you to respond to a couple of those, we've got some people who shared. Um, so Robert Holloway shared, thank you, Robert. Um, first leadership role many years ago, I tried to make changes too quickly. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so I think that would probably fall under the, the falling Pray to the action imperative, right? Um, thoughts on that, Bill? Um, so let's take a step back. So when you're new in a leadership role, e either when you're new to a company and it's your first leadership role or you've moved into a leadership role, it's only natural you want to make an impact right away. You want to show that you were right, the right person who was selected for that position. So it's only natural that some of the transition traps you mentioned, Julie, um, would would be um, would be traps with respect to you want to add a lot of value, you want to take on a lot, uh, take on more than perhaps realistic. But the last trap that you mentioned, I want to highlight in particular, um, because often when people talk about leadership, most people know you have to develop a good relationship with your boss. Most people know you have to develop a good relationship with, the, with your direct reports and the people that you lead. But when it comes to relationships, one area that's often overlooked, and I'm really glad Watkins talks about it, is uh, neglecting the horizontal relationships or your peer relationships. And your peers can be a really key enabler for success for a number of reasons. One is, you can learn a lot from your peers because your peers have different experiences. And on a very practical level, probably at some point your peer is going to be in a position that's higher than you. So you also have to be politically savvy that you want to have good relationship with your peers because at some point when your peers may indeed may be your boss. Yeah, and building on that, the issue with peers is, um, you know, as you grow in your role, um, you know, they they can become key influencers and um you know as we teach in in one of our um training classes you know influencing and having impact is all founded on relationships and it it has to be life lifelong uh career long or organization long you know it's not something that you do situationally you you build that so yeah those peer relationships are really important um so a couple other folks put some of their challenges in and i you know you can see, we can see the fit um, so again, Ro Robert said, you know, I tried to make changes too quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we have Colleen Bracken. Hello, Colleen. Glad you're with us. She misjudged the organizational culture. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I want to, we'll talk about that. I'll, I'll read one more. We can, we can talk about all three of these. Um, and then Colette Scott, thank you for sharing this one. She said, imposter syndrome, doubting my abilities in my first leadership position, working with people who were more seasoned in the work. Right. Um, you know, it's interesting. You know, Bill and I were talking about this uh, a little earlier. Um, when you look at those three examples, they kind of fit in aligned with the, the, the transition strategies. You know, Robert was about um, kind of strategy, you know, tried to make changes and action, make, make changes too quickly. Colleen, I misjudged the organizational culture. You know, that was about kind of probably the, the people and the culture. And then Colleen at Colette's was imposter syndrome. That was about her. So you talked about that earlier. And when we get to the, the, the transition strategies, um, they fall neatly into those categories. So um, well, can I touch upon yeah, what Robert had mentioned about trying to move too quickly? So Watkins does talk about that. He, he introduces this concept of a breaking point where when you're a new leader, you have to find the intersection point between it's my language, not Watkins, is to be an observer, to listen, to really learn what's going on in the organization. Part of it is, as Colleen mentioned, culture, but the the intersection point is when you are going to add value. So I think Robert brings up a good point. I think in Robert's example, he probably shot out of the gate too quickly, wanted to add a lot of value, but yet he had not spent enough time to really be an observer and really be a learner um, and he was too anxious to add value until he was right. really ready upon reflection. Right, and and when we get to the, the strategies, you know, th th there's a balancing act because some of some of these strategies, you know, can you know, can impact the, each other, and they can, you know, in some ways they can work in opposition. Um, we're going to talk about you know get early wins, but we also don't want to make sure you have have the answer. So um, we have a couple more comments. Ray Zazo says, failing to stop and listen, mm -hmm. um, you know, which again, I think, you know, again, that ties that, that issue of pace when you get in there. Um, and then um, Janine Pratt mentions knowing when to say, I'm new, let me get back to you or having confidence to share perspective and respond. So um, yeah, so there, there's definitely a pacing issue. And so, you know, that 90 days, you know, three months can go really fast. Mm -hmm. it, it can. Um, and that's where, and everyone sells a little different, but however you define a plan, it's critical. And I think the first 90, and I wouldn't necessarily take that literally, but I think the first 90, let's say 120 days, you do need to plan before day one. Uh, and I would even say that as you're going through the interview process, you have to assume you're going to get the job and to begin thinking about, okay, if I get this job, what does the first 90, 120 days look like? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. And, and so we could, that, that's a, we could actually mm -hmm. probably spend a whole, mm -hmm. a, whole com a whole session mm -hmm. on, on talking about that. Mm -hmm. So let me put out the, so, so we we're going to put everything on the table at once. So this is kind of my philosophy with a lot, with training. You put a lot of information and then you see what is most relevant. Mm -hmm. We want to hear from, from you, from our viewers. Um, and again, this is Work Life Leader Live. I'm Julie Cohen, the CEO of Work Life Leader, and I'm with Bill Hyman, executive coach and HR consultant. And we are, um, this is the Work Life Leader Live book group, and we are discussing uh, The First 90 Days by Michael D. Watkins. And I'll just show it. So in case you want to see the great, mm -hmm. yes. Um, so you, Julie, can yeah. I come back to something that Ray said about listening? Yes. Which I think is so important. Look, anyone would say, of course, listening is important. But as we all know, listening is easier said than done for a lot of us. And Cuffey in his book um, talks about that often many of us, and by the way, Julie, I'm guilty today of doing this, is often when you're listening to someone, you're kind of listening, but you're also thinking about how are you going to respond to the to that person. Yeah. And I think Ray is suggesting, if I could take editorial liberty is to really listen at a deep level, truly understand what the other person's saying, ask clarifying questions, and don't worry about how you're going to respond. Truly be present, truly listen, and, and try to understand what the other person is sharing with you. 
Right, and, and Bill is highlighting a really important distinction of, of you know, listening to understand versus listening to respond. And, um, you know, that's, listening to understand is, is I think, a critical component of executive presence. And, um, you know, people know the difference when, when you are there with them. And that has the impact of building the relationships too, which whether it's pure or, you know, above or, or, you know, with your direct report. So, um, you know, again, it sounds like Ray, Ray knows, knows the value of that now, which is, which is great. So, um, I'm again, I want to throw everything. I want to throw all the, the, the spaghetti on the <laughs> wall. Is that the right phrase? It works for me. Okay, good. You know what I meant, right? <laughs> um, so these are the 10 strategies for transition, transition acceleration. And um, these are the chapters of the book. Uh, if so, if you have read a different edition, so there's mul there's the, I've read the updated and expanded edition, just so you know. Um, and that's the one I have. But they they've changed they tweaked the these um, these phrases. So if you have an older edition of the book or you read it a while ago. These might just sound slightly different, and we we figured oh, that out. Really, I also have the the. Uh, oh, you do? Okay. I, I have the same one, so we're speaking the same language. Okay, we today. are, but I found online a different version of this. So, so with that, here are the ten strategies, um, and they are: number one, prepare yourself; two is accelerate your learning; three is match strategy to situation. Next is negotiate success, secure early wins. I mentioned that um, a little earlier. Achieve alignment, build your team, create alliances. Again, I think that that one fits in with you know, Bill. You were talking about you know the importance of peer relationships. Manage yourself um, and accelerate everyone. Okay, so those are the ten strategies. Now, again, we're not going to be able to go in depth with all 10 of them. Um, be curious for those of you who are watching who either have read the book or maybe just hearing those, you um, are curious um, or have questions, please put any questions, comments um, in the chat box and we will get to them. We got a couple um, more comments. So Colleen responded to, to Ray and all of us if I had stopped and listened more deeply and broadly in different settings, I would have read the culture better. Mm -hmm. And then um, Chris Midgley mentioned missing some short-term little wins to build credibility with a new team by focusing too much to start. Don't boil the ocean in 90 days. That's don't boil the ocean in 90 days. That's, you know, it, and, and that's a really hard thing because I think for most people who are moving into leadership roles, again, whether it's, you know, senior leadership or a first leadership role, you want to make a good impression and you want to, you know, you, you want to show your talent and you want to show impact. That's, that's natural. I mean, that's kind of what, you know, you're, we, you're, you're trained for, right? And so it's how to pull back and, you know, these these strategies can address that. Go ahead, Bill. And so can I just share one? Can I want to share one example because because Chris Mitchell brings up a really good point about early wins. So early wins can be pretty. You know, some people call it low hanging fruit. Typically, when a leader comes into a new role, there are early wins or low hanging fruit. And I'll share one with one of my leadership um, coaches right now, where same organization but she was promoted into a new leadership role. Early win was as simple as asking the staff, what do you think are some of the things that we can do right away to have an early win? So she didn't have to be the answer person. She asked the staff and it was as simple as the staff said, let's really evaluate the meetings we have. How are they done? How could the meetings be done differently? She took the time to listen. She showed that their input's important that was an early win. So the meetings were shorter, they were less, uh, you know, conducted less frequently, and it can be as easy as that. That wins a lot of goodwill uh, when you come into an organization within the first 60, 90 days, and you can do a very simple, easy win like that. Yeah. So let's hear some of your early wins. So that's, again, that's one of the strategies. 
um, where have you had success in an early win? Or if you're struggling and you're in a new role and you're looking for an early win, tell us your situation and, and we'll we'll help you think of some. Um, so Colette just shared, small wins have been so important as I have transitioned into a new role over the past four months, helped build my brand and create trust. Colette, can you share if you want? Do you want to share what one of those wins are, if appropriate? We'd love to hear it. Um, and anyone else who's watching. So you're watching Work Life Leader Live, our book discussion group. I'm Julie Cohen and I'm with Bill Hyman and we're talking about the first 90 days by Michael Watkins. Um, so early wind, that's, I know that's a favorite of yours. What, what other ones stand out for you, Bill, as really important? Well, I they're go, all important. Right. I want to go back to something. This, this actually isn't touched upon in the book, but it's come up a couple of times. And I think Colette had brought it up and, and Janine had also responded, the whole notion of imposter theory. Anyone who's been in a leadership role and anyone who's been an executive coach, that's often discussed. And I think often we have to get clarity around what self-defeating messages are we sending to ourselves. Okay, so first it's clarity around what are we, in what areas do we feel like we are being an imposter? What negative thoughts are we sending to ourselves? And is it possible to step back as though you're talking to somebody else and say, okay, are there other ways of thinking of that? So let's say, um, I'll, I'll use an, my own personal example. So I was the head of HR for a mid-sized company. And the area that I felt um, very vulnerable in was around executive compensation, okay? So I felt like an imposter. I need head of HR. I need to know a lot about executive compensation. And I was, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of depth. I stepped back and say, you know something? As the head of HR, I don't need to be an expert in every area. I need to find people who are smarter than me to really help me um, in that area. So that's an example when you're feeling like an imposter to really try to stop that self-defeating um, message that you're sending yourself. And I know it's easier said than done, but to begin looking at, are there other ways of, of looking at, at a particular yeah. imposter syndrome? And I think that falls under you know, addressing imposter syndrome, actually you know, looking at, at the strategies, the transition strategies would be, I think under prepare yourself. And um, you know, self-doubt is, is part of, human nature mm -hmm. and um and preparing to step into that new role uh, and bill shared something really important is that preparation for that new role doesn't start the day you walk through the door and um it literally starts when you are on the market and when you're starting to interview um and then when you get the job until you start the job um it, that's a really good time to do an inventory to, to see what tools and resources you need to go in there and to turn the volume down on that imposter. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can logically address that, but sometimes until you get in there, you know, it, it, it's hard to do that. But um, we got a couple more comments about some early wins. So mm -hmm. Robert said, getting the input from your team on low hanging fruit shows your listening ability and builds your credibility with them. So mm -hmm. actually doing that in itself Mm -hmm. is, is another early win because you're building those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, Colleen said, one of my clients got an early win by firing a toxic team member that no previous leaders were successful mm -hmm. in getting rid of. Um, I, mean, I think that that's, again, really powerful. You have to know history. So you have to know context. You know, if you did that too soon and didn't do it to the right person, it could, you know, get, you know, it could backfire. But making sure you have enough time and, and knowledge and understanding that can be really powerful. Um, we have Mark. Hi, Mark Wilhelm. Um, moving to a new company after 20 years at current company in which I grew to a director level. New company At new company, I know only one person need to build, rebuild all levels of relationships, particularly peer. So Bill, if you want to kind of maybe go a little deeper on that, you talked earlier about that, that importance of building peer relationships. Thoughts on you know what would what would Michael Watkins say about Mark's situation? Am I breaking the rules, Julie? If I introduce a different book right now? Um, no <laughs> rules. Yes, we're fine. You know me. I'm a rule follower, and I'm like, do I have a rule on that? Because the, because you know who comes to mind is Adam Grant. So Adam Grant, for those who are not familiar with him, he's an organizational psychologist 
at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's written a number of books, one of which is called Give and Take. And that's really around how do you develop really meaningful relationships with others? And Mark, you bring up a really good point that when you're new in an organization and you don't have a relationship with anyone, uh, in my opinion, and I think Watkins would agree with that too, is really taking the initiative, be very intentional in terms of who initially uh, you want to reach out to, um, but also be very clear when you're reaching out to others what the, what the objective of that meeting is. So when we talk about building relationships, it's not just talking about family and, and uh, hobbies, which could be a part of it, but you really want to be intentional in terms of why you want to have the meeting, what you want to get out of it, and primarily it's to learn from the other person, the culture, uh, team, um, business challenges. Um, but again, it all goes back to that 90-day plan of identifying initially those people that you do want to initially um, reach out to. Yeah, and you you just described what I was going to say about the the importance of being curious. In those, mm -hmm. in those relationships, so, so building you know a strategy to build relationships, Mark, with with you know in a new organization where you know you are getting your feet wet, um, is is to hey, you know, I have some questions, or I'd like to you know learn a little more. Um, could you share your expertise and wisdom? Um, you know, I've 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 seen over and over again most people. Um, you know, it's an ego boost when you reach out to them and say, hey, I, I think you could, you know, really help me and, and I value your opinion. Um, so so that, that, that's another strategy. Um, Bill, you look like you're- uh, Julie, but Julie, I love the word curious because yeah. part of curious means you're very interested to know what the other person is sharing. Mm -hmm. And part of showing interest is asking follow-up questions. And what you want to avoid is to show to to draw upon your own experience. Hey, well, when I was at this company, when I was in that position, and it turns into you're not curious. You want to show the other person how much value you can add to their organization. So, um, uh, I, I I do love the word curious in in, in that context, Julie. Awesome. Um, and then let's see, we have lots of comments. This is awesome. So Janine said, I advocate for my staff from the start, so they have confidence that I will have their back. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see. Um, oh, thank you, Colette. Colette just said, be curious is such an important phrase. But previously she said, one of the first projects I was asked to do was to increase the reliability of a summative examination in medical school. A lot of work, change, management, and buy-in. The exam was a big success. Reliability increased and helpful for an upcoming accreditation visit. So um, that's fantastic. It sounds like you 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 hit it out of the proverbial park, Colette, in that in that um, in that project. And Julie, going back to Janine's comment, because to me it raises a larger issue of how do you build trust with others within the organization. So um, okay, I'm I'm sorry, I'm breaking another rule. Now, now it's going to now I'm it's going to show like I, I want I read all these books which I don't but it just happens to be the books that I'm familiar with, um, the five dysfunctions of the team. So in the five dysfunctions of the team, Whoa. the you're, you're dropping, you just got a bunch of feedback. We lost okay, that. Right. You're so the five the five dysfunctions of of a team, the the foundation of building a high effective team is trust. Right. And in that book, they talk about. Um, being vulnerable and sharing some of kind of like going back to what Colette said, showing some of your insecurities to minimize being the imposter theory. Cause we all, we all have some of those concerns and, and um, insecurities. Yeah. And you know, as simple as it is and, but a lot of people don't do this, you know, even saying it, I'm like, of course, this is common sense. Trust is built by, saying, you know, doing what you say you're going to do and, sh you know, showing up um, as you say you will. Um, and especially as a leader, it's it's walking talk and role modeling, um, you know, kind of organizational values, but also your values and being able to put a stake in the ground. And this is this is what I believe. Um, wow. So, Colleen, in addition to what Julie said, ask. <laughs> 
Ask the people who interviewed you why they hired you and what they observed as possible shortcomings in you during the selection process. Ooh, um, no one is the perfect, here, I'll show this one. No one is the perfect fit. Valuable information lies with the people who interviewed you about what you need to learn and develop. Yeah, so, so that is a really great, um, another great strategy. Um, and it doesn't uh, put the onus on you to, you know, figure it all out, you know, coming to a conversation with one or two questions. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, a lot of people, I mean, this, this ties back to another topic that we often do training around, around networking and building relationships. Um, you know, a conversation only needs to start on one or two, you know, meaningful questions, only really one question, and then it, it can build from. So, so that's a really great way to get some more information. Um, and then Julie Clausen, hi, Julie. Make sh making sure you meet with all those important stakeholders and not let your schedule get in the way. Mm -hmm. I have heard people reading into why that leader didn't meet with them. Um, so I think this talks about something. So th this is what, what Julie just said. Um, you know, depending, especially depending on the level of your organization, you know, there's going to be people watching you. You know, if you're a senior leader. Um, everyone around you will be watching you. Um, you know, obviously your, 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 your boss, your manager, but your peers will be watching you to understand like who you are and how you show up and most definitely your direct reports. And then, you know, depending on how the organization is designed, a lot of people will be, will be looking at you. And so, um, you know, I, in the ideal world, they're looking at you from a welcoming, nurturing lens. Um, not with a critical lens. And yet, again, depending on the culture, um, you don't know. As Colleen you know, talked about, sometimes you don't know the culture. So, so it's really important to um, understand the impact of all of your behaviors as you integrate any of these transition strategies. They can have um, you know, ripple effects. Back at you, Bill. Um, I, I was going to shift gears for a second, Joel. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting. Watkins obviously wrote this book before the pandemic. Right. And it's going to be interesting. And maybe you can invite me back on the show in a couple of years, because I think in our lifetime, potentially, there could be more changes in the workplace that we've ever seen um, in the past, you know, in the past century with respect to the obvious. Now that we have technology, now that we've lived through a pandemic, um, are people going to be working in a brick and mortar office anymore? So question number two, there used to be a very hard line between corporations and getting political in any way. Those lines are now um, blurring. Um, so when as coaches and when we're coaching leaders and we talk about how do you show up to work, I mean, now that, that's both the literal and figurative phrase is where is work going to take place? And when you look at the 10 um, core areas that Watkins talks about, to what extent might that look different in the next two to five years, depending upon what the workplace uh, looks like? Um, yeah, I think you're spot on. So um, the the first, yeah, the first, hey, Michael, if you're watching, <laughs> think about the first 90 days, you know, post COVID or, um, you know, the, the new world of work and the first 90 days, um, because I agree it will, it will definitely change. So, um, I've got a couple more comments. This is great. Colette said fit is important to success. Agree with Colleen. There is no perfect fit, but when stepping into a new role, take advantage of fit for the small wins. Um, and Colleen Bracken just did, wanted to acknowledge your good point, Bill. Um, so David Kohler. Hi, David. Um, we so we keep discussing team and firing a team that reports to you. But can y'all? He says I'm from Texas. Uh, awesome. Uh, discuss which team reports peers or superiors is the priority in the 90 days. So the answer, David, is yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Bill. Do you want to? No, you, you stole my thunder. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Um, I think the issue, so if you look at what Watkins is saying, um, the secure early wins, you know, definitely can impact all three, you know, the, the, the team you're on and your, you know, your manager, your peers and your direct reports, you know, build your team. That's one of the strategies that is about 
you know, the, the people that report to you and who report to them, but really, um, you know, if, the, if it was the senior executive team, uh, here, I'll quote another book, um, you know, Jim Collins, good to great, it would be getting the right people on the bus. Um, and um, so, so that's about, you know, the, the, the new leaders team. Um, let's see, learning, you know, create alliances, that's really about, you know, um, peers. So, so really, David, it, I, I think it's, you know, there are a lot of balls in the air when, you know, in this first 90 days and, you know, you need to prioritize, you have to prioritize those small wins as opposed to boiling the ocean, as we talked about. And, um, you know, building on what Julie Clawson said, I think it's important that you make sure that you're touching on all the key stakeholders in some capacity. You know, you, you may not be able to build, you know, you're not going to be able to build deep relationships with everyone you need to build in 90 days. Um, but you know, I think that the piece of you know, being visible and people knowing you is, is, is really in, important. Um, so Julie, unlike, I, I think it's a great question that David asked, unlike you, I can't remember all 10. So the way that I, like to look at this book is that, and again, this is my interpretation, not yes. Watkins, that those 10 things, principles can be broken out into three big buckets. One David calls out is the importance of relationships. And, and he's right. There's many different teams, many different stakeholders. So one is relationship. The other is what Colleen has touched upon a, a couple times about being a student of culture being a student of the organization, being a student of the business challenges. And I would say the third bucket is knowing thyself, that having some self-awareness as you're going into this role, what are you good at? What are your development areas? Where do you need help? So that's another way, in my opinion, to look at this, knowing yourself, relationships, and then being a student of the organization. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I, when I said earlier, that was your, you know, your wisdom, you know, the self, others, and strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so we didn't give you an answer, David. We gave you the yes. So um, <laughs> that's the answer. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's not a, exactly. Um, so Colleen asked, should the first 90 look different if you're virtual? Um, Hmm. Watkins doesn't talk about that. What what does Colleen and others think? Yeah, what do you guys think? That's great. Right. Well, we don't want to answer or we're clueless. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I have an opinion, of course, and you have an opinion. We always have opinions. So that's one of the things about Work Life Leader Live is that um, all my guests have opinions. I make sure they do or they're not a guest. So they answer but, every question. But Julie, all kidding aside, though, is, you know, depending upon how many years of experience you have being a leader, Ask deflecting and asking others when they ask a question is always an appropriate. Great strategy. Appropriate way, right? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 you just want to make sure you don't do it all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> or people That's are going to say, do you answer any question? And, um, that, that and there are people thinking. who do that. I have been in situations where that is their go-to line. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've worked for a couple of those people. Not, not my first boss. <laughs> who's on the call listening. Um, all right, so I, you know, the first 90 days looks different if you're virtual. You know, I think from a conceptual standpoint, these these strategies are pretty mm -hmm. foundational. So, um, you know, I think from a book standpoint, you know, tactics may be different, but the strategies I think are pretty, pretty consistent. Um, just as, um, depending on the type of organization you're in, it will be different, right? That's actually one of the, um, one of the strategies for transition acceleration is match strategy to situation. Mm -hmm. And the context in the book of this is make sure you know where the kind of the growth strategy, um, wh where the organization is. Is the organization a startup? Is the organization, you know, in, what are the thing he called it the stars model? Yes, uh, startup turnaround. Turnaround. Do you remember them? Yeah, I do, because I wrote them down. I That's good. To, I, I wanted to make sure that I remembered. Uh, startup turnaround, accelerated growth, realignment, or sustaining success. Right. So that's a part of the piece. Is what 
either what is this organization going through or what is you know the team you're brought in to lead you know your subset of the organization you know what is their core challenge that you were brought in to to address and again a sustaining organization where you know you're just brought in to replace a leader is very different than you know an organization that you know needs to grow you know 20 percent or 30 percent in the next year or you know you need to dig them out of a hole so very different approach in lots of areas you need to know what you're going into so so colleen pushed back colleen she said probably yes but how is the challenge building relationships is so different in a virtual setting people who were hired during covid were so challenged yes um it it, it is and um I think some some people and some organizations are you know definitely are doing it better and are you know some people thrive in this environment. Some people can be more assertive and more active virtually, and you know others, you know this is totally not their environment. And so to me, there's an opportunity. Um, again, this this would fall under prepare yourself if you are starting a new role. You know in you know, and I think it was like what Mark said. Um, understand what your strengths are and where you see your challenges are going to be and either get support, get a coach or, um, you know, kind of lower your, maybe either your own expectations or have a discussion about this. This isn't my preferred way. How to meet people, you know, talk to HR. How can you help me with this? Um, what thoughts, what strategies, you know, get support on, on you know if the the virtual relationship building is not your forte it doesn't mean you can't do it it means you may have to think differently um and and creatively and so, so you know as a coach i believe anyone can do it they just may need different tools strategies and support than they're used to so do you have any additional comments yeah julie the one the one additional thought that i have is and this was pre-pandemic the higher up you go in an organization from a leadership perspective uh, there's a number of things that differentiate um, the superstars from others. One is around what we talked about as relationship, but the other, and I think the pandemic is going to accelerate this, is uh, comfortable with gray and comfortable with ambiguity. And I think we are now in a period in the workplace where ambiguity um, is on steroids. That you know, if you're comfortable in the black and white, we are not living in a black and, and white. Uh, workplace anymore. And I think leaders really need to give a lot more thought that one size does not fit all. And how do I as a leader work through some of these business challenges, knowing that things, at least for the time being, are going to be very, very great. Yeah, very good. Um, Chris, Chris made a really good point. Virtual makes you be more intentional. You have to carve out the casual conversations that can't happen at the water cooler. Um, 100% true. Um, and again, some people do that more naturally and others are going to have to flex or adapt their style. Um, and maybe, you know, again, get out of their comfort zone or, you know, ask others for help. Uh, so, so really, um, you know, again, the more senior you are, you know, those relationships are going to be really critical to start. Um, so we're coming, um, ah, Julie Clausen, ambiguity is really concerning people now. So true. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, to me, that is a, um, that's always, you know, kind of managing uncertainty is always, this has always been an important leadership concept or just a, just a concept for, professional success. Um, but now in the new world of work, um, and in the, what is it, the, the VUCA, uh, the volatile, uncertain, I always forget them. Um, You're on your own on this one, Julie. I know. Volatile, <laughs> uncertain, what's the C and the A? Um, oh my God, someone's watching it and their brain is working. Remind me what the C and the A of VUCA is. But it's, it's about the new world of work and all of the, um, you know, all of the unknowns that are increasing. And so that issue of managing ambiguity and being adaptable and agile and flexible, um, you know, that's gonna be a really important muscle to build. You don't have to be, you know, in all of these, everyone doesn't have to be, thank you, complex and ambiguous, Colleen. I knew you would know that. Um, and uh, you don't have to 
you don't have to be everything to everyone immediately. You may have to be everything at some point at different stages, but um, you know, even at the most senior, know what you were brought in to do and continue to build. Um, so we're going to be wrapping up in the next couple minutes, Bill. It's amazing how fast an, uh, an hour goes. Um, but as we think about, I always like to, so I always start these conversations with an icebreaker and I like to end it with what I call the big rocks. Um, so, you know, again, great book. So Bill, so I liked the book. The content was awesome from a personal standpoint. This was a hard read for me because I'm, I'm, um, I have it Bill, you're laughing. How would you describe it? I had a hard time with this. Well, you know, I would always describe it in the Myers-Briggs language. So for those who are familiar with the Myers-Briggs, to me, this book is kind of like an SJ. It's, it's here's the rules, here's the roadmap, and just go to it and follow this, this roadmap. I think Julie has a lot of that, but she also has much more of a creative flair. So if you're looking for more creative uh, uh, style, this book probably would not resonate with you. Well, again, so so what I did, I read it differently. I, I read, so when I read a book, I do read every word, which looking back, I probably could have not read every word and I would have probably got as much out of it and um, got through it quicker. So it was a long read for me. Um, but again, the information is great. And I think you hit the nail on the head. It was a stylistic issue. So um, what's your big rock? So one point you're taking away um, and you think people should remember. So to me, I was so glad that there was a lot of focus on um, the importance of being very intentional. Um, intentional is very important pre-pandemic. And I think it was, I hate to stroke his ego, but I think it was Chris Midgley who said <laughs> that intentionality is even uh, more important, especially when it comes to relationships, as we're still working virtually. And um, and, and the second big rock, you only asked for one, but the, sec did. the second big rock is um, the importance of having a plan. And yeah. that 90-day plan, 120-day plan needs to be constantly refreshed. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, so I, you, you, I, I actually agree with you, um, you know, that issue of, you um, uh, Mark Wilhelm just said the audio book reads much better due to good narrator. Thank you. Um, that, now you Mark, now you tell me. Great. Um, thank you. Um, is, you know, that issue of you know, this is, it's not, it, this is such a critical part of the next step of your career. So you really want to invest um, because, you know, again, that cliche, you know, you only make a first impression once, you know, you only have one set of first 90 days, at least in that role. And so, um, you know, the more you can be, you know, planful, mindful, um, and strategic and prioritize, um, you know, the better you will be. And, and I think this, this book gives you a great roadmap for that. So with that, a couple, um, Closing items. First, I want to thank Bill Hyman, my good friend and colleague. Bill, can you tell people how they can reach you? Uh, they can reach me either on my website, wahhrconsultingservices.com, or my email, same web address, but instead of .com, at gmail.com. Yeah, and we'll also put your LinkedIn, we'll put a link to your website and um, you can connect. I assume you're comfortable with people reaching out to you via LinkedIn. Absolutely. Um, and I just want to let you know what's coming up. So um, our next Work Life Leader Live leadership chat is actually next Friday, June 18th at two at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, our topic is called Talent Mobility for a Resilient and Resourceful Workforce. And my guest is Amelia Smith from um, People Rise slash Randstead. Um, and Leah Hyman just put your website in there so in the in the in the comments so that's awesome she's the head um, of she's the head of marketing for my it's firm. great great it, it's keep it keep it in the family right <laughs> um and then last but not least um if you enjoyed the hour and you have topics you want to hear us discuss in the future or books you're interested or that you've read that you want to hear you know um us go into more depth 
please put it in the comments. And also, if you think you should be a guest with me here talking about, you know, smart people talking about the intersection of work, life, and leadership, please let me know because I love talking to, to, to folks about all these topics. So thanks all. We're glad you were here and look forward to seeing you next time. Great. Thank, Thank you, Julie. You know. Thank you, everyone.